How, much, how many of you enjoyed the young people here this morning bringing the praise and worship? I want to tell you, that's the hope of America. That's the future of America, the young people. And they were here in church on a Sunday morning, leading us to the throne of God. Let's have, let's have another hand for them. We really appreciate it. Great job, guys and girls. Great job. Great job. Today, I would like to speak to you, and the title will be, In Other Words. Normally, I start off with a scripture, but I have a lot of scriptures, so... I'll start off with a little joke that I wrote. Hold on to your seats. Now, I actually wrote it last year, but I've been saving it for the right time. And just think, today, December the 9th, 2012, for the first time, you will be hearing it with your very own ears. All right, well, anyway, here we go. A spokesman for the General Motors Company announced today that its Pontiac Division and the Ford Motor Company were discussing the possibility of a one-time joint venture to try to pump new blood into both companies. They're, they're revealing plans to merge the Pontiac Trans Am and the Ford Focus, I mean the Ford Fusion. The experimental, car, the experimental car will be known as the transfusion. There, there you go. That's, that, that's all you get, folks. That's all you get. What do you expect? Uh, I'm a frustrated comedian. My wife wants me to go on the road. She's been telling me that for years. No, no, anyway. But today, I would like to do the same thing with the scriptures. I would like to, like to take Psalms 27 and merge it with some Old Testament scriptures and some New Testament scriptures. And by doing this, I'll be using other words, so therefore the title of the message, In Other Words. You know, it's like when some people go to church, they haven't read the scripture all week. They want the pastor to mix a little word with a little life and spoon feed them. But now there's others that have read the scripture during the week and they're able to feed themselves. Then there's others that are so full of the word that they could get up and preach or teach and feed others. It's kind of like at a football game. you got these players running up and down the field. You know, everything drained out of them. Some of them can rehydrate themselves by simply taking a drink of Gatorade. But some of them are so spent that they have to go to the locker room at halftime and get fluids put in them through an IV. If you remember back when Miss Susan was bitten by that snake, they had to pump a lot of bags of IV in her. You know, spiritually speaking, when the enemy has an unprovoked attack, you have to, uh, you have to strike back with the word. All right, today, for those that will listen, I'm going to hook up the IV, and I'm going to pump it to you. 2 Timothy says that all scripture is inspired by God or God breathed. See, God is spirit. And when he, when he breathes, in fact, he's, he breathed life into Adam. After he had formed him, it was a man's body, but there was no life there. He breathed life into him. And the word spirit means breath. Uh, 2 Peter uh, 1, 21 and 22 says that uh, no scripture is a matter of man's own interpretation, but it was God, by the Holy Spirit, speaking to man. So the scripture, the scripture is powerful. Now my goal is not to add to or take away 
you know, when I, when I bring these, when I merge these scriptures together, it's not to, to, to take away from the scripture or add to it. There's three warnings in the Bible against that. One of them's Deuteronomy 4, 2. One of them's uh, 12 and 32. And then Revelation 22, 18 and 19. I want to give you an, an example of that, of, of how you can merge these things together. And I'm going to use the help of the Gibbs girls. Now, if you don't know who the Gibbs girls are, there's, there's a family in this community, and it was a lot of girls. Of course, now you know what happens to girls when they, when they grow up and get married. They change their last names. Well, all the Gibbs girls may have different last names now due to marriage, but to us, they're the Gibbs girls. Even the next generation, the Gibbs, the Gibbs family. So anyway, uh, you can take the word of God, and it's, it's like this basket. Now, this basket is all woven together. There's, there's pine straw in here, and there's uh, sweet grass. And you know, the word can be so sweet, just like that sweet grass. But the word can be stiff, like that pine straw. And they call it pine needles because on the end of it, little points. And you can, you can get the point. It can be rigid. For strength, it can be soft and flexible and sweet. But see in, on the inside here, brown looking, that's the straw. That's the Old Testament. That's the law. Stiff, rigid, but it brings strength to the Word of God. Then it's interwoven with that sweet grass. You could say that's the New Testament. It brings life, you know. You have the law, and, and you have the Spirit. But, you know, Jesus said that he was the fulfillment of the law. He didn't say he did away with the law. He said he fulfilled it. He fulfilled it. And see, when you weave all that together, then you can, uh, you can put things in there, and you can tote them around, or you can put them on display or whatever. But the Word of God, and that's what I want to do. I want to weave this together. And... The girls were nice enough. One of them gave this basket to Linda, and I wanted to use it as an example. And I said, but I need some straw coming out of the end there. And uh, Landy took that and wove that in for me. But I, I said, now you've got to have it where I can take it apart and give the basket back to Linda because I didn't want to mess up her, her basket. But this, this is going to represent the Word of God. I, I want to weave it together and hopefully show you some things you didn't see before. Now, the presentation isn't always my strong suit, so just overlook the vessel and listen to what, listen to the treasure inside of the vessel. See, my thing is when I, when I sit down and prepare this, that's when I get fed. Y'all getting the leftovers. I'm just... I, you know, I've already had my meal, so I'm going to try to feed you a little bit from, from what, uh, from what I've, I've uh, gleaned. And I'll be using the New American Standard Bible, but I will make reference to the King James and the Amplified, and maybe even make, uh, you know, some comparisons. But uh, each one of them has a lot to offer. Is, is this for me, Pastor Bob? Oh, that's mighty good. Now, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep it down. All right, let's look at, uh, at Psalms 27, verse 1. Now, I fully intended to, to go through all 14 verses, but I don't think time's going to allow that, so we'll go as far as we can. And, and I, I want to show you uh, some things in there. It says, verse 1, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Now look at that word, Lord. It's all capital letters. All capital letters. One large capital L, 
But then the other smaller letters, they're all capitals. Did you know that that is the proper name for God used in the Old Testament? It's only used in the Old Testament. If you see it in the New Testament, it, it would be because it was uh, a, a scripture that was quoted from the Old Testament. But that's the proper name, and it's translated from the original Elohim. And it's all also written with all capitals, Y-H-W-H. So when you see that word, all capitals, Lord, that's referring to the God of the Old Testament. Now let me just read you a scripture uh, from Genesis 1-1. In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. This word God is, means Elohim. And the meaning of that is God. Plural of majesty. Plural in form, but singular in meaning. With the focus on great power. In other words, Elohim is the plural form of the proper noun that refers to to a single God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. One God, three parts. Genesis 1, 26 and 27 says, And God said, Let us, let us, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, let us make man in our image. Plural forms, according to our likeness, and let them rule. Let man, man, man was plural. Well, man can mean all of mankind now. Let man rule, and it gives a description of what to rule over. You know, God rules. He made man in his image so that man would rule. And now look at 27. Well, listen to 27. because And God created man in his own image. It goes back to the singular pronoun. And God, in the image of God, he created him, male and female, and he created them. So it's, it's confusing to a lot of people because it's a plural form but it's one God. I said earlier, God was, uh, man was created in, in God's image. Man is spirit, soul, and body. Three parts in one. And you can find that in, in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 3. We won't go there, but uh, God, God created man in his image. God be into three parts. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Now, there, there are a couple other forms of this same word, Lord. You have, it's a capital L, and then small O-R-D, Lord. And normally that means master, and it's, and it's written as, as Lord. And it comes from the form of Adonai. And there's an example in, in the Amplified Bible of uh, where it uses two different forms of this. And, and it's uh, Psalms 110, verse 1. And it says, the Lord, and it's all capitals, and in parentheses, the Amplifies puts God. It recognizes that that capital L-O-R-D all capitals, is God. Then it says, The Lord said to my Lord, and this is simply capital L and then all, small O-R-D. And it's got in parentheses the Messiah. In other words, you could, you could rephrase this and say, And God said to the Messiah, Sit at my right hand. You know, and, and that would be simple forms. All right, there's another form of this word, Lord. All small letters, L-O-R-D. Small L-O-R-D, Lord. 
And that, an example of that is Sarah called Abraham Lord. Now, I've been working on that with Linda, but I, I just haven't, I, I haven't been able to get her to that point yet, but I haven't given up. Anyway, all right, there's a scripture in Deuteronomy. Let's put that on the screen. Deuteronomy 10, 17, and this is an example where it uses all three forms. For the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God who does not show partiality nor take a bribe. You see there? The capital L-O-R-D, all capitals, that's God. That's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That's the Godhead, God. That's the Lord. And then it talks about capital L and then small O-R-D. That's, that's the Master. And then he's the Lord of L-O-R-D-S. So, He's the master of all lords. This, this word Lord, I have a strong concordance. And I've had it for years. And it's very tiny print. It's real small print. And you know, the older you get, the smaller it gets. That's right. So I, I bought a new one that, that said, you know, new advanced, large print, but the thing that I didn't realize when I bought it is they've kind of tweaked the meanings a little bit, and sometimes, you know, I'm from the old school, don't be changing my meanings now, you know, but, you know, and today, if you look in the dictionary, there's words in the dictionary that 10, 15 years ago, they don't mean what they do now, you know, the, in other words, usage has caused the word to change a little bit, but I just want to—I just want to uh, read just the two that that show uh, the word "Lord" with all capitals, and it's thirty sixty-eight. And in the old one, it said that it's from the word; it, it it's from a different word, and it it means the self-existing or eternal Jehovah, Jewish national name of God, Jehovah Lord. And in the new one, it says, same word, it says, it means Lord, Yahweh. So, you know, some people like Jehovah, some like Yahweh. It's the same word, same person, you know, same name, same God. The proper name for the one true God, knowledge and use, use of the name implies personal or covenant relationship. The name pictures God as the one who exists and or causes to exist. Well, we know both of those are true. All right, now we've looked at the first part of uh, verse 1. We've looked at the word Lord. Now, I'm going to pick out some key words, and obviously that first word is the key to, to all Scripture. You know, that is the key word of all key words. So uh, we've, we've looked at that, so I want to go on to the second part of that and look at the two words light and salvation. Light. In John 1, uh, 1 through 4, John starts out the same way Genesis does. He says, in the beginning was the Word. Now we know that is Jesus. That's a, cap that's a capital W there. That's, that's Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. How can you deny that Jesus is God? Some, some people do. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being by Him. Jesus created all things. Apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Well, what did Jesus say? That's what John said, under the power of the Holy Spirit. But what did Jesus say? In John 12, Again, therefore, Jesus spoke to them, saying, 
I am the light. I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Jesus confessed that he is the light. All right, the next word, salvation. Acts 4.12. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Well, what did Jesus say? John 14, 6. Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's salvation. Jesus is salvation. What about Titus 2, 11 through 14? For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to men. The grace of God, that's Jesus. Jesus is the grace of God. He has appeared, bringing salvation to, to all men. Verse 12 says, instructing us to deny ungodliness, worldly desires, and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age. 13 says, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory. Now I want you to catch this phrase. The glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's not talking about two, two people. That's not saying God the Father and Jesus the Son. That's saying the appearing. Who's going to appear to get the saints? Is God the Father coming to get the saints? No. Jesus Christ the Son is coming to get the saints. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm hammering on this for a reason. The glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself. See, it's not a plural, it's, it's singular. He gave himself. He's God and Savior. Jesus Christ is God and Savior. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself a people his own possession, zealous for good deeds. Did you know that Jesus in the Greek is the same thing as the Hebrew name Joshua? And it's, it's pronounced Yeshua. In Hebrew, it's pronounced Yeshua. Well, in our English versions, it's Joshua. That name Jesus is the same name. So if Jesus, if it was all written in the, in the Hebrew uh, language, instead of, instead of Jesus, it would have just been Joshua. And if really it would have been Yeshua. And it means Yahweh saves. That's what the name Joshua means. That's what the name Jesus means. I mean, Jesus lived up to that. God saves, is what it's saying. God, God. Jesus saves. Jesus is God. God died on the cross in a human body, in the form of his son. Now, I can't explain that to you, but that's what happened. Colossians 2.9 says, For in him, for in Jesus, all the fullness of deity, and the King James and the Amplified say, the Godhead. All of the Godhead dwelled in him in bodily form. Just think, we're just on the first part of the first verse. We've got miles to go before we sleep. Let me see if any, no, I don't see anybody sleeping. Selah. Pause and think on these things. In John 10, 30 and 31, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. 
The very next verse says that the Jews picked up stones to stone him. Now, why would they pick up stones to stone Jesus? Because he was claiming to be equal with God. And the Jews knew that. And that's why they, they said he was blaspheming and they were going to stone him. John 20, verse 28. And this was after Jesus uh, was crucified and he was raised from the dead and he met with some of the disciples and Thomas wasn't there. And so Thomas said, well, I'm not going to believe till I put my fingers in the holes in his hands and check out the, the spear wound in his side. I'm not going to believe till then. Well, eight days later, he appeared again and Thomas was there. And this is Thomas's report. John 20, verse 28. Thomas answered and said to him, to Jesus, My Lord and my God. And if you look up this word God in the concordance, it means the supreme divinity. Now this is the same word that Jesus used when he was talking earlier to Mary, after Mary Magdalene, when he first rose from the dead. And the same word for God that Thomas used is the same word that I'm going to show you right here. And Jesus said to her, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But, I go, but go to my brethren and tell them, I ascend to my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. Those same words, all three of those, those two right there and the one that Thomas used, is the same word. Thomas testified that Jesus was God. All right, let's move on. The, second, the next part of the verse, verse 1 says, Whom shall I fear? 2 Timothy 1.7 in the King James says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. And in Acts, Acts 10, 24 through 21, Jesus was talking with the disciples, and he said, you know, the, the, uh, the student is not above the master, and the disciple's not above the teacher, uh, so forth. He says, now they've called, they've called the master the devil, Beelzebub, so... You know, if they call me that, then, you know, they're going to do the same to you. He says, don't fear them. Those aren't the ones you're, you're to fear. He goes on to say in, 20 sec, in uh, 28, And do, do not fear those who can kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul, but rather kill him who is able to destroy both the soul and the body in hell. And... He goes on to talk about, you know, aren't, aren't two sparrows sold for a penny? He says, you're, you're worth more than many sparrows. So don't, don't feel, the, uh, therefore don't feel, fear them because you are worth more than, than many sparrows. You know, in today's society, we got it a little bit backwards, you know, we try to save the spotted owl, and we kill the babies. Jesus said you're worth many spotted owls, many sparrows. All right, uh, the Lord is my defense. The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? All right, let's look at the word defense Isaiah 59 19 in the King James says when the enemy shall come in like a flood the spirit of God the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him Proverbs 2 7 and 8 says he stores up wisdom for the upright he is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the paths of justice. 
and preserves the way of his godly ones. Psalms 118.14 The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. And I'm not going to read all of this next one, but it's Psalms 91, 1 through 16. All of it is good. All of you know, I recommend that you, that you read that. And uh, let me just read two verses out of it, 1 and 2. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abi- abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. I see, I'm trying to take scriptures from other places and just kind of amplify or magnify the, the ones that we have, have here before us. There are several other scriptures that, that talk about uh, taking refuge in the shadow of thy wings. And that those are Psalms 17, 8, Psalms 36, verse 7. 51, verse 1, and 63, verse 7. All right, uh, the word dread. The King James says, uh, be afraid. I will not be afraid. So, Psalms 118, 6 says, the Lord, the Lord is for me, I will not fear. What can man do to me? Romans 8, 31. What then shall we say? To these things. If God is for us, who is against us? And Paul says in Romans 8, 38 and 39, I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, or any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. All right, let's look at verse 2 in uh, in, in Psalms 27. When evildoers came to me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and my enemies, they stumbled and fell. When I read that, the first thing I thought about was Jesus in the garden when the Roman cohort and, and the, uh, the soldiers from, from the high priest, they came to Jesus, and Jesus said, well, who are, you, who are you looking for? And they said, we're looking for Jesus. And he says, well, I am he, and they fell to the ground. Well, that's just where my mind went. But when I was reading this, I looked, and it had a, a, a reference there, and it referred to that same scripture. So I must have been on the right track. And, in fact, the scripture I was referring to was John 18, 3 through 6. And, and 6 says what, what I just shared, and they drew back and fell to the ground. Now, you know, why is this right there? in the middle of what David's uh, writing. Here he's writing about, about uh, you know, God uh, being his strength and all that, and then he talks about his enemies falling to the ground. Let me, let me give you how I see it. Uh, David wrote Psalms 22. Psalms 22 is a description of a person being crucified on the cross. The only thing is, They didn't crucify people on crosses then. They stoned them to death. So, I believe that David was having a Holy Ghost flashback into the future. Because, see, he wrote 27. Well, he's flashing back into 22, which is what's going to happen in a thousand years, the crucifixion of Jesus on the cross. Now, it's kind of like Yogi Berra said, it's deja vu all over again. Well, if you don't know what deja vu means, then that's 
not very funny, you know. So uh, it's kind of like the scriptures. You gotta you gotta know the scriptures in order to when the Holy Spirit gives you something, you know, he can he can take you there. And deja vu is the illusion of already having experienced something that's actually being experienced for the first time. Well. I guess the opposite of that would be like a flashback. You go back into something. You know, I've, I've had a couple of flashbacks in my life, you know. Uh, one, I was over at, uh, at Northbridge on Cosgrove, and this guy and I from work were, uh, were shrimping. And it was right at, right at sunset, and uh, there was this oriental couple walking towards us, and... We, we just got the net and, and got ready to, to shrimp, and this helicopter flew over. And I can't explain it to you, but for an instant, I had the same emotional feeling as when I was in Vietnam. It was just, it was instant, and it was gone. It was a flashback. But, you know, I've, I've had some other things, you know, but uh, I'm sure you've had some things like, well, you know, you felt like you've experienced it before or, or perhaps, you know, it, it takes you back to, it could be just a brief moment. I think my opinion as far as it was, it was like a spiritual experience, he's writing and the Holy Spirit just flashed him back to that for a minute and then, well, that's my story. <laughs> All right, uh, verse 3. Though the host encamp against me, my heart will not fear. You know, somebody said that the Bible says 366 times, fear not. That's one for each day of the year, and it even covers leap year. So uh, just, just a couple of scriptures uh, about fear not. Uh, Psalms 23, verse 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Proverbs 3, 25 and 26. Do not be afraid of the southern, of sudden fear or the onslaught of the wicked when it comes. For the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught. All right, let's go on to the rest of the verse there. Though war rise against me, in spite of this, I shall be confident. Hebrews 4, 16 says, Therefore let us draw near with confidence to the throne of God that we may receive mercy and, and find grace to help in the time of need. Philippians 1, 6, For I'm confident of this very thing, that who, he who began a good work in me will perfect it until the day of, of Jesus Christ. Philippians 3.3 3 says, and put no confidence in the flesh. Proverbs 21.31 says, the horse is prepared for the day of battle, but the victory belongs to the Lord. In other words, it's our job to prepare the horse. It's our job to do what we've been called to do. But the victory, the final victory, will be in the hands of the Lord. Psalms 20, verse 7. Some boast in chariots, some boast in horses, but we will boast in the name of the Lord our God. Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. I'll just read part of 24. Let him who boasts, boast of this, that he understands and knows me. That's a capital M, it's talking about God. 1 Corinthians uh, 131 and 2 Corinthians 1017, they both quote this scripture. Let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Paul said that he boasts only in his weakness. And Ephesians uh, 2, 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's a gift of God not as the results of work, that no one should boast. All right, verse 4 in, uh, 
in Proverbs in, in uh, Psalms 27. One thing that I've asked of the Lord that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Psalms uh, 23, 6. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Psalms 26, 8. O Lord, I love the habitation of thy house and the place of where thy glory dwells. In Psalms 122, 1, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Right, the next part of, of verse 4, to behold the beauty of the Lord. This word beauty uh, literally translates delightfulness. That's in a footnote in, uh, in the New American Standard and in the, in the King James. Isaiah 53, 1 through 3, when he was describing the Lord, he said, He has no, no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. Jesus himself said that he had no confidence in the flesh. Right, the next part of the verse, And meditate in his temple. The New American Standard says, meditate. The King James says, inquire. And the Amplified uses both words. And the Amplified does that a lot. It'll take one word that the King James uses and, and the, the alternative word that the New American Standard, in, it'll incorporate it in, in both of them. So uh, I, I wrote a couple down for... Uh, couple of verses for meditate, but I want to really look at inquire. But uh, the ones for meditate, Psalm 63, 6, when I remember thee on my bed, I meditate on thee in the night watches. And Joshua 1, 8, the book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. That's that, uh, that's that straw. Yeah. Some people have given up on the Old Testament, but that's, that's that strength. That's that strength. You can't, you can't throw out the Old Testament. When it, gets, when it gets completely fulfilled, then I'll throw it out. But so far, it, it hadn't been completely fulfilled. Jesus fulfilled the law, but all of the word hadn't been fulfilled yet. So I'm going to hang on to both sides of it. Anyway, uh, let me get back on track here. Uh, to meditate day and night. How often should you think of the word? Day and night. Day and night. Other than that, you're free to do whatever you want, but day and night, you think about the word. I think that's revelation. <laughs> but <laughs> So that uh, you'll be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous. Isn't that amazing? We're trying to get out there and be prosperous. God's telling us how to be prosperous right here by meditating on the word day and night. Then you will have success. Ooh, we could stop there and preach on that, but uh, let's, let's go on to the word meditate literally means inquire. Looks like the King James got it right. And of course, the Amplified uses both. So uh, let me give you some scriptures and this first one's my favorite, about inquiring in the temple. And this is Luke 2, 46 and 47. And you remember the story, Jesus was 12 years old. He stayed and he was in the temple. And his mother and father got in the caravan and went on, you know, and then they had to come back and find him. It took them three days to, to travel and get back. And when they found him, it, it says, And it came about after three days they found Jesus in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking questions. That's inquiring. So Jesus at 12 years old is giving us an example about inquiring in the temple. 
He was listening, and he was asked in questions. And all those who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. Isaiah 1.18, Come, let us reason together, says the Lord. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. God said, Come, let us reason together. Pastor Bob, you're just sucking it out of me. I'm trying to look all around, but I just, I'm, I'm focused on you because you're drinking. So, anyway. Jeremiah 33, 3. Call to me and I will answer you. And I will tell you great and mighty things that you do not know. It's a two-way conversation. If you call... He will answer. Jeremiah 29, 12. Then you will come to me and pray, and I will listen to you. You know, we've all, we've all had questions. We've all asked God, you know, why. Jesus, when he was on the cross, he cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And he was God. And he had questions. All right, let's go on to verse 5. Now, I could really, you know, I, could, I could spend all the time here, but I'm going to I'm gonna have to control myself and, and stick, stick with this. It says, For in the day of trouble he will conceal me in his tabernacle. The day of trouble... If we look at, at, at Daniel, and we're, we're not going to go there, but uh, the day of trouble refers to a seven-year period called the tribulation, and it's also known as Jacob's trouble. Now, if you look in Daniel later on, uh, it'll be Daniel 9, 24 through 27. Daniel talks about a 70-week a period that was for the Jews, and it even tells you what it's for. To make, to make atonement for, for their transgression. They were, they were carried off into Babylon because they disobeyed God. They didn't honor the Sabbath. And this 70-week period was actually, the, the, the week was actually, instead of seven days, was seven years. So it was 70 weeks times seven, which gives you 490. So it was, 400, it was a 490-year period. But Daniel said that after 69 weeks, the Messiah would come. And that would be 483 years. He said after the decree was signed for them to go back and start rebuilding the temple in Jerusalem, when that decree is signed, the clock starts. Now you start counting. When 483, day, 483 years are complete, the Messiah will come and will be cut off. 483 years to the day when that decree was signed, Jesus rode into Jerusalem on that donkey. He was proclaimed as the Messiah by the multitudes. The religious people would have nothing to do with it. He was cut off. He was crucified. And time stopped on this calendar of 70 weeks. 69 weeks were fulfilled, and then there was a gap. Dr. David Jeremiah calls it a parenthesis. 2,000 years. But the Jews still owe God one week. Seven years. That seven years is Jacob's trouble. The tribulation. The Antichrist will come. It's not going to be a nice place to be on this earth. This period of time is referred to as the wrath of God. That right there tells me I don't want any part of it. The wrath of God. Isaiah 61, 2 says, The day of the vengeance of our God. Revelation 16, 1 says, And I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seventh angel, 
go and pour out the seven bowls of the wrath of God into the earth. But you know the good news? Listen to what uh, 1 Thessalonians says. It says we're not appointed for that time of wrath. As Christians, as Christians, you're not appointed for that. 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 and 10. For they themselves report... about us, what kind of reception we had with you, uh, how you turn to God from idols to serving the living and true God, to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. That's pretty plain, but He says it again in uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. God has not destined us to wrath, but obtaining salvation through the Lord, through our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, that puts it pretty plain. You can stay here and go through the wrath of God, or you can be saved and escape the wrath to come. The next part of this verse says, He conceals me in His tabernacle. The word tabernacle indicates a house or a dwelling place. Now, I read some, some scriptures earlier about being in the shadow of, of the wings of God. You know, it's more intimate to be with God than in His shadow. I know it said that, that Peter's shadow fell on some people and they were healed, but those people didn't have an intimate relationship with, with Peter. They, they experienced the power, you know, coming from His shadow. But... This, when you're, when you're in the house, a son is in the house. Psalms uh, 61, 3 and 4. For thou hast been a refuge to me, a tower of strength against my enemy. Let me dwell in thy tent forever. Let me take my refuge in the shelter of thy wings. See, the shelter of thy wings is different from the shadow of thy wings. I think this verse is talking about, uh, about the rapture of the church. Look at the next line. It says, In the secret place of his tent he will hide me. This word tent, the, the word place, in the secret place of, of his tent he will hide me. I want to look at this word place. John 14, 2 and 3, Jesus said, In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you might be also. Jesus went to prepare a place for us but he sent the Holy Spirit to prepare, to prepare us for that place. You know, there are some people that would not be happy in heaven. They would be miserable. Because they haven't been prepared for that place.